Okay, so since we didn't get a chance to actually um, load your electrophoresis samples during lab, I wanted to just go over some of the steps and show you how we ran the gels um, and what they look like. And then I just wanted to go over a few things you need to think about as you're analyzing your gels. Um, some of it should be review, but just to make sure you have all the information. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about are those samples that we collected. So remember when we were doing our purification, you took samples from each fraction, and some of the fractions you mixed with that stinky blue stuff. So those are the ones that we're going to load um, on the gel. So that was samples A through D. And remember two of the things the stinky blue stuff contained was it has SDS. So remember the SDS um, is going to help denature our proteins and it coats them with a lot of negative charges and it gives all the proteins the same charge to mass ratio so that when we run them through our gel they're going to be then separated solely on the basis of size because they all have they're all feeling the same force um, from the electric field okay so that's the SDS but the one thing the SDS can't do is it can't break disulfide bonds so if your protein has a lot of disulfide bonds Remember, those are covalent bonds, so those are harder to break. So we need a chemical that will reduce those disulfide bonds. So that's what the beta mercaptoethanol does. And that was actually the stinky component um, of that sample buffer. So those two things together help denature it. And then just to really make sure that it's completely denatured and those chemicals have access to all the proteins, we boil it for five minutes. Okay, so this is just um, boiling some of your samples, okay, so that they're ready to load on the gel. All right, and then here's just a sample of um, just showing you how the gels are actually poured. So there's two glass or sometimes plastic plates. So this one is a little bit bigger, a little bit taller than this one. And there's a small spacer plate on this. So that just means when you put this plate on top of it, it's just separated by a very small space, so maybe a millimeter um, in diameter. And then you pour the gel, so you pour the acrylamide of the resolving gel, and then it polymerizes to form the polyacrylamide gel. And then you pour a stacking gel over top of that, and that's the gel that you can insert a comb in, so that when you remove the comb, you'll actually have wells in that polymerized gel, and you can load your samples. Okay, and here's what it looks like after you've done this. So this is actually a gel we purchased pre-cast. So the gel is between basically two plastic plates. And then here's the comb that they inserted to form the wells as this was all polymerizing. Okay, so you take those gels. And then our particular apparatus, we can load two gels. So you put two gels in this... Um, chamber facing each other with the short plates facing each other and then you can pour buffer between those two gels so that it goes over that short plate and into the wells and then makes contact with the top um, of your gel basically okay and then from there we can load our samples into various wells so we're going to use I just used a regular p20 but you can get um, gel loading tips. So these are specialized tips that are going to be narrow and a little longer so that you can actually insert the tips into the well and slowly release your sample. The sample buffer also contains some glycerol to make it denser than the water. So when you release it into the well, the sample sinks to the bottom and you don't have to worry about it mixing with your other buffer. Okay. All right, and then here um, is the gel loaded. So you can see the blue sample buffer in each of the wells. And then that was loaded into this bigger chamber. And we've added now electrophoresis buffer around the outside. So this will now make contact with the bottom of the gel. And then we attach the electrodes, and you can start running the gel. Okay, so it's going to pull the proteins through the gel from top to bottom. All right. And here is the gel after we've run. So notice there's this blue line at the bottom, and that's what we call our tracking dye. So remember we added it was stinky blue stuff. So that's brome blue. 
and it basically is just to help us figure out how long to run the gel. We don't want to start running proteins off the bottom. So you run the gel until the tracking dye um, basically forms a line near the bottom. Okay, but notice we don't see any proteins. So this blue didn't dye any proteins. It ran separately from the protein. So hopefully there's proteins that are left at various places in the dye when we stop the run. So our next step is we want to crack open these two plates, peel our gel out, and we're going to add our gel to our staining solution. And we're staining our protein with a Komasi blue stain. So that Komasi blue is the same dye that's in our Bradford reagent. So that's going to bind to proteins um, and turn them blue. But after staining them, we have a problem in that basically it turns everything blue. So the whole gel is blue. So we have to add it to a de-stain to remove the blue from the gel and just leave the blue where it's actually binding to the protein. Okay, and once we've done that, we should get something that looks something like this. So that each lane has proteins in it. Notice these first four lanes have a lot of proteins because there's a lot of bands in each of those lanes. All right, these lanes over here have less protein. And in fact, a couple of the lanes maybe only have one protein. At least we only see one band. All right, and then we've loaded also um, a lane of standards. And I'll talk about um, what we do with those standard proteins in a minute. Okay, so now we can think about actually looking at your gels. So the gels have been stained and de-stained, and I took pictures of them, and they are now posted on Goucher Learn. So you can find your gels, figure out which lanes your group was loaded in. Um, and right before looking at your gel, though, let's think about a few questions. So think about what you expect to see on your gels. So based on your Bradford results, so you've looked at the protein content in each of those samples, and also just thinking about our purification scheme, what do you think each lane might look like, right? Where are going to be the most proteins? Which lanes are going to have the least amount of proteins? What do you think the eluate should look like? All right, and then also think about uh, what fractions do you anticipate finding our protein. Where's the multis binding protein going to be? So again, think about its location in the cell and our purification scheme. Which of these fractions should contain multis binding protein and which shouldn't? Okay. All right. So now we've thought about that. Let's look at starting to analyze our gel. So the first thing I want to talk about are those molecular weight standards. All right, so you purchase, we basically purchase some molecular weight standard. So it's a mixture of these proteins. And the actual proteins aren't that important. What's important is that we know the molecular weights of each of those proteins. So when we see the gel, we now know how those proteins move, traveled through the gel, and we know their molecular weight. So we can now make our standard curve, okay? And our standard curve, in this case, we're going to plot the RF, so we're going to plot the relative distance each um, of those proteins traveled through the gel versus the log of the molecular weight. So in order to get a straight line, we need to graph the RF versus the logs of the molecular weights. And remember the RF, it's that relative distance. So you're going to measure the distance of each band from the top of the gel and put that over the total distance, so the distance from the top of the gel to the tracking die. All right, so how far did the gel actually run? Okay, and then how do you measure each band you're interested in? So one way to do that might be to use a program called ImageJ. Some of you use this in Bio 105 when you were working on projects. It's a free program, and it's pretty intuitive and easy to use. Um, Dr. Lankowski has a YouTube video so I've posted it here, and it's also posted um, in some of the information where your gels are actually located on Goucher Learn. Um, and so that you can quickly go through and actually use the program to measure um, each lane. And so that's each band. So that's an accurate way of doing that. But I want you to also double check. So some of the bands might be kind of faint, and they might not show up that well in the picture. So if you don't see any protein, check in the lab with the actual gels to see if there's any faint bands that you need to measure. And in that case, you'll have to measure them on the actual gel itself. 
okay? And so you'll have to measure everything itself exactly on the gel. Okay, um, so here's what an actual standard curve should look like. So here's our RF versus our log molecular weight. And then we can make a trend line and determine the equation of the trend line. So then we can use that standard curve to determine the molecular weights of the protein bands in your gel. So the things that you're interested in. So remember, we're only interested in those bands that we think might be our maltose binding protein. So you don't have to measure every band you see, but pick out ones that you um, are interested in and measure those. So now you'll have the RF of your unknowns, and you can use the equation of this line and determine the log of the molecular weight that's given by this standard curve, okay? But remember, we don't really want the log of the molecular weight. We want to convert back to actual molecular weights. So you need to take the anti-log to convert the log of the molecular weight back to just molecular weight, okay? So when you're writing your lab report, you don't want to talk about RF values, and you don't want to talk about the log of the molecular weight. You only want to mention the actual molecular weights that you determine, okay? And just as a reminder, that's the 10x, 10 to the x button on your calculator, okay? And then just to have something to compare it to, the maltose binding protein that, are, that is in our cells should be around um, 51,000 Daltons, so 50,800 Daltons, okay? All right, so now you've got your gel, you know um, hopefully what you're measuring, and you've thought about what each of those fractions should contain. So now start analyzing. Go back to your predictions, right? Did you purify maltose binding protein? And if you think you did, what's your evidence, right? Don't forget all those questions in your lab manual. All right, they're there to help you, and we also expect to see those in your lab um, right up. So think about the percentages and, you know, how many molecules of maltose binding protein there might be in your sample and in your cell. All right, so which predictions were accurate, which predictions were not accurate, and then think of a reason. So remember, not your error. So it's not that you didn't pipette correctly. Think about the experimental setup itself. So what things could you change that might give you either better results or what could be some explanations for why it either worked or didn't work, okay? So think about those things. Um, hopefully this video was helpful. If you have any other questions, please feel free to come see us. Um, as I said, the gels are up on Goucher Learn, and they're also in, um, they will be in the lab itself, so we can talk about them um, in lab in the next few weeks.